What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about bronchiectasis. This is a part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this, it helps you. Please support us, and you can do that by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and also subscribing. Also, really urge you guys, if you guys have the opportunity to go down in the description box below, we get a link to our website. We have a lot of cool stuff that I really urge you guys to become members of, because there we have a lot of notes, illustrations, we're developing question banks, we're developing exam prep courses, and we got some merchandise that you guys can check out there. So please do that if you have the opportunity. All right, let's start talking about bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is basically defined as you have this like massive bronchial dilation secondary to a lot of inflammation within the airways. So we have to ask ourselves the question, when a patient comes in that we suspect may have bronchiectasis, what really is the classic finding that really would cue you off to think that this is the cause? Because we talked about in other obstructive lung disease, because this is one of them, asthma, they come in with potential findings of maybe uh, some particular dyspnea, maybe they come in with some wheezing, whereas those with the COPD, they come in with either a productive cough, dyspnea, they come in with wheezing as well. What's well, really the telltale sign to really break this one off of the obstructive lung diseases? Really the classic thing is they have so much mucus in their airways that whenever they expectorate and they clear this mucus, it is really intense. It's super thick and it smells absolutely horrific. So sometimes we say that they have this thing called a foul smelling productive cough. So it's this really nasty mucopurulent type of sputum that they will expectorate. And that's usually kind of this classic finding that we see in patients who have what's called bronchiectasis. Now the question is why do they have so much mucus that's within their airways? And why is it so foul smelling? That probably means that there's a lot of inflammation, probably infected material there. Well, let's kind of explain that. So here we have a patient who has a normal, complete, healthy airway. But then for whatever reason, we decide to bring about a lot of inflammation, all right? So here we're gonna talk about those causes in a second, but here, this thing right here is really taking this airway and just turning it on hyperdrive and saying, hey, let's go either and increase a lot of inflammation within these airways and then lead to what? Well, when you inflame airways, you know what one of the big things happens? You stimulate these things called goblet cells. And goblet cells, they love, they love to produce a ton of mucus. And so one of the things that you'll start noticing is that these patients get a lot of mucus that builds up within their airways. There could be other reasons why besides inflammation, but we'll cover those. Now look, I got this inflamed airway with a ton of mucus. The other thing that happens besides just the mucus is that this inflammation starts causing other particular processes to occur. But for right now, I want you to know that we're gonna trigger this massive increase in mucus production. Now the next thing that happens is this mucus traps a lot of bacteria. So imagine if we trap a lot of bacteria within this mucus and we also keep continuing to have inflammation, what's gonna potentially happen? Well, the inflammation starts kind of destroying some of the bronchial walls and this leads to this process called bronchial dilation. So then we start seeing dilation of the bronchioles. And not only is this kind of dilation is occurring, but you still have, guess what else? a lot of mucus lining this particular airway. So it's just this kind of vicious cycle of inflammation that propagates increasing mucus production, the mucus will increase inflammation, the inflammation will lead to the dilation of the bronchioles due to a lot of destruction of the bronchial walls, and again, this is just kind of this vicious cycle. I think one of the big things to remember is what's the end result of this? Well, one of the things that happens is you build up mucus, and inflamed airways and then dilation is that these airways become so filled that they become obstructed. And so one of the primary themes that I think is important to remember in patients with bronchiectasis is they exhibit features of what's called airway obstruction. In other words, these airways are so filled with mucus and they're collapsed from because of these bronchial airways being so weak and destroyed that it is almost impossible to get things like CO2 out. And so these patients will potentially air trap and they, can, they potentially can develop features of hyperinflation. But one of the classic, classic features of these patients is they exhibit features of what's called airway obstruction. So bronchiectasis is a part of the category of diseases called obstructive pulmonary diseases. And the reason why is there's mucus that builds up secondary inflammation, dilation of the bronchioles, and then bronchial collapse, and as well as mucus that are filling up the airways, they can't get air out and they obstruct their airways. So the question then comes, okay, what in the heck is the cause of all of this bronchial inflammation that's propagating mucus production and dilation of the, of the bronchioles? Let's come down and talk about that. The first thing I want you guys to think about is that generally, 
there could be dysfunction of what's called the mucociliary apparatus. So you know there's these particular uh, cells, and what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to take things like and push chloride out, right? These are these transmembrane ions. And in patients who have diseases, such as what's called cystic fibrosis, so let's say that you have this disease called cystic fibrosis, they have the inability for the cystic fibrosis transmembrane receptor protein to be able to produce chloride. So they have this defect in these transporters where chloride will not be excreted. Why is that important? Well, whenever goblet cells make mucus, so let's say here it makes a clump of mucus, this mucus that's produced by the goblet cells can be thinned out by the chloride. But if under the circumstances that you don't have chloride, what's gonna to happen to this mucus? It's not gonna be able to get thinned out, and what is the result? They develop a massively thick kind of mucus that obstructs the airways. There's one way that we get a lot of mucus, and if mucus gets caught up within those airways, what can it entrap? Bacteria. What can bacteria do to the actual bronchial tissue? Inflame it. And then with inflammation, that chronic inflammation will also lead to dilation, and then over time lead to airway obstruction. So again, big, big problem here is very, very thick mucus because you lose the ability for these chloride molecules to get taken up into this actual mucus uh, kind of molecule right here, a mucus clump here, and to thin it out. All right, that's one reason patients would develop this. So think about this, cystic fibrosis, especially in a younger patient with other history, um, maybe they have a potential history of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or other diseases, particularly like recurrent pulmonary infections and lots of mucoperlin sputums. Another particular thing that you'd wanna think about as a cause here is a very interesting one, and this is when the cilia stop working. So let's say that these cilia, normally what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to beat up mucus and particles and things to that effect all the way up like kind of this escalator, right? So if there's a chunk of mucus, let's say, right here, which has some bacteria in it, it's gonna move it a little bit up here via these cilia. It'll move it a little bit up here via the cilia and it'll move it up here via the cilia. But now you've destroyed this process. So now you lose the ability to move and mobilize this mucus upwards so that you can spit it out or swallow it. And so what happens to the mucus? It builds up and builds up and builds up. And so as a result, these patients will build up mucus. And if you build up a lot of this mucus, guess what's gonna happen? You end up with the process that we've just talked about. So the question is, what so there's a, there's a buildup, there's an increased buildup of mucus. What is the cause of this, where the cilia aren't working? This is called primary ciliary dyskinesia. Another uh, term which is thrown around sometimes is called Cardiganer syndrome. But primary ciliary dyskinesia is one particular thing to think about here. What happens here is also you need to remember that in primary ciliary dyskinesia or cardigan syndrome, they may also have other diseases. Usually, uh, you think about situs inversus and you think about chronic sinusitis in combination with bronchiectasis. And a patient with cystic fibrosis, you think about bronchiectasis, frequent pulmonary infections, as well as maybe even exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And other organs are usually involved as well in cystic fibrosis. The last one that causes mucociliary dysfunction is when you have an airway obstruction. This could literally be anything, I'm not, I'm not kidding. Let's say, that I'm just gonna use this as this one thing here that there is an obstructed like substance of some sort. There's a substrate here and it's blocking the movement. It's similar to like not having cilia if you wanna think about it here. Cilia is intact, but here we have some mucus, let's say, that we wanna move along and kind of clear. But if we can't clear that mucus, what is it gonna do? It's gonna build up. And so it's the same kind of concept here that as these goblet cells produce mucus, you want to be able to clear that mucus, but you have something that's obstructing the movement of the mucus. There's a lot of different things that could do that, but it's the same concept, you're gonna build up mucus. So over time, this will definitely lead to the same concept here. But you wanna know what are those things. This could be a tumor, I'd say that's a big one because that's gonna be more of a chronic process, or chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, particularly chronic bronchitis, think about COPD or maybe some type of foreign body. This is another one I would definitely potentially consider as well. But these are something 
that would lead to mucociliary dysfunction. The next question that you have to ask is, okay, these things make sense as to why there's a ton of mucus. The mucus will do what again? Carry with it and keep within a bacteria. Bacteria can cause tissue damage. Tissue damage propagates more inflammation. More inflammation leads to dilation of the bronchioles. And then again, with a combination of mucus buildup, inflamed bronchioles, and then dilation, you lead to potentially airway obstruction. The last thing is what if I have recurrent infections? That can cause inflammation, right? So recurrent infections are really important. You gotta think about it two ways. One is you have a lot of bacteria that you're being exposed to. One is called Pseudomonas. And there is a particular disease that has lots and lots and lots of Pseudomonas that colonizes the airways. Do you guys know what it is? I want you to remember and abbreviate it. It's called cystic fibrosis. So you see how that's a big one there? Cystic, so Pseudomonas will definitely lead to lots of bacteria that then destroy or inflame the airways. That's one particular thing. You know as you cause airway inflammation, what do you then do? You stimulate goblet cells to produce mucus. And as you increase that mucus and propagate more of the actual inflammation of the airways, you'll lead to this upstream effect that we talked about, or the downstream effect that we talked about up here. What's another bug? Another one would be what's called Haemophilus influenza. This is a really big one. You know what the disease carries this one a lot? COPD. So patients with COPD carry or colonize this bug a lot. Other ones I think that are important to remember here is what's called um, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. These bugs right here, so this is usually bacteria, this is more of like a fungus. I think one of the big things to remember about allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillus is they have these crazy high IgE levels and they have lots and lots of eosinophils. This is like the only type of like air, you know, airway disease where there's tons and tons of inflammation and mucus that's not due to neutrophilia. Uh, usually asthma and things like bronchiectasis can have lots of eosinophils if it's due to this disease. So there's lots of bugs. What if there's not enough immune function to clear these bacteria or other types of infections? So they don't have a good immune system. So I think patients who have very diminished T cells or very reduced numbers of IgE antibodies. What if you have decreased number of T cells or decreased IgE antibodies? Are you gonna be able to fight off particular bacteria? So let's say here's a bacteria, and this bacteria is gonna induce damage and injure these actual respiratory cells, which propagates more mucus production. So you get a lot of mucus. If you don't have the proper immune system to fight that bacteria off, right? This will not be able to be inhibited, right? And so this will continue, this bacteria will continue to destroy the airway tissue. What are diseases that cause a reduction in T cells? HIV. What's a disease where you have reduction in Ig antibodies? Various types of immunodeficiencies. These could be a hereditary immunodeficiencies. We can call this like hypogammaglobulinemia. But you get the point. There's destruction of the actual tissue that leads to an increase in mucus production as well as more inflammation of the airways which propagates this process. The last one is when a patient has chronic inflammation that's systemic that maybe damages the lung tissue as a result. It's not localized, it's systemic. And then as an adverse effect, it hits the lungs as a result. This could definitely be due to a lot of nasty antibodies, right? So usually this is autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune diseases, that carry lots of particular things like ANAs or maybe rheumatoid factor, which you'll see this in diseases like SLE or you'll see this in diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, things to that effect, these will really go and attack this lung tissue. And as it injures and inflames the lung tissue, there's other diseases like scleroderma as well, it'll do what? Increase, rev up the production of mucus by the goblet cells. And so these will start making lots of mucus. It'll propagate increased inflammation and then dilation of the airways and then airway obstruction. So you guys get the point. And a patient who develops bronchiectasis, think about that nasty, foul-smelling, productive cough in a patient who has very dilated but inflamed, filled airways with mucus due to mucociliary dysfunction, such as in thick mucus, or a problem being able to move the mucus or recurrent infections or chronic inflammation. And again, this is a part of your obstructive lung diseases. 
What's the potential complications of bronchiectasis? Let's talk about that now. All right, my friends, so now we're gonna talk about the complications potentially associated with bronchiectasis. When a patient comes in with bronchiectasis, we already know they get a lot of foul-smelling, productive cough, filled with mucopril and sputum. We know the particular pathophysiology. We know the causes now. What we then have to watch out for is what are the downstream negative consequences of this disease? One of the big ones, and I'd say one of the most common things that you really wanna watch out for on your exam is hemoptysis. And the reason why is this is a chronic disease. And so that chronic inflammation, what will happen is the inflammation over time will erode and eat away at the vessel wall. And so it'll cause mucosal erosions. And you know what's right here supplying the bronchioles? There's a beautiful artery called the bronchial artery. 90, 95% of the time, bronchial arteries are the most common cause of the bleeding that rushes into the actual bronchial tree. So it leads to bronchial artery ulceration, let's say. And as you ulcerate that puppy, then you get hemoptysis. So then what happens is, let's kind of like see how this kind of all occurs in sequence. Chronic inflammation, mucosal erosions, bronchial artery ulceration, hemoptysis. So let's flush this. Look, here's all this inflammation where all the mucus and bacteria and all that stuff are. Chronic dilation, this starts eating away at these tiny little bronchial arteries. And then as that happens, blood easily enters into the bronchial tree. And when this enters into the bronchial tree, it's nice and irritating to the actual mucosa. What would you then do? <coughs> And this will then lead to them coughing up a lot of this type of bloody types of material. Sometimes some of this blood could get stuck down here into the airways. That's not a good thing. That can definitely lead to respiratory failure. But that is a possibility. But oftentimes, they'll cough up some of that actual material there. And that's something that you really want to watch out for. If a patient has hemoptysis, think about bronchiectasis as a very common cause. Okay, what about respiratory failure? This is another really big one. Because it's a chronic disease, it leads to chronic inflammation, mucus development within the airways. Now, because of that, think, think of this. If you have this problem, you got this big mucus plug. So mucus plug, that's actually developing within these airways. What is that gonna do to the actual ventilation to this alveoli? The ventilation will be impaired. So it's gonna be really, really difficult to get good ventilation into this alveoli and good ventilation into this alveoli. So you'll have a reduction in ventilation here, but your perfusion may be normal. What is this called? This could be a VQ mismatch, right? But here's something really interesting. Yes, you may have reduction in ventilation, but here's another concept. When these patients plug up their airways, it is not only a difficult time getting air in, you know what else happens? They have airway obstruction. And so from this airway obstruction, two things happen. They have a kind of a mixture of a respiratory failure. One of the things that's really, really interesting is as you develop airway obstruction, what do you do to your lungs? You cause hyperinflation. If you obstruct the lung, can you get CO2 out? No, the lungs build up, they get big. As a result, they develop hyperinflation. If you hyperinflate your lungs, how difficult is it going to be to get air in? Take a deep breath in, hold it, don't exhale, try to take a deep breath on top of that. That's what it's like for these patients. So as a result, they develop something called hypoventilation. And when they develop this hypoventilation, the consequence is, is that they don't actually bring in enough oxygen. But the other problem here is that they don't clear enough CO2. And as a result, these patients have two particular problems that ensue as a result of this. One is they have very low O2s, but they also have very high CO2s. And so this is another particular thing that you want to watch out for, is they'll develop features of what's called hypoxemia and potentially hypercapnia. What kind of respiratory failure is this? This is an example of what's called a type 2 respiratory failure. So this is something to potentially watch out for with these patients. All right, what's another thing that can happen in patients with respiratory failure due to airway obstruction and hypoventilation? What could they look like? They could look terrible. Some of these patients may exhibit increased respiratory rate, increased work of breathing, dyspnea. So other things that you wanna watch out for is what do they look like? And if they're working hard to breathe, if they're breathing at 50 a minute, that is also a potential sign of respiratory distress and therefore respiratory failure, not just the low O2. Again, something to watch out for. Last potential feature here is usually because of the respiratory failure. So patients who have bronchiectasis, this is usually chronic. They're living with hypoventilation and VQ mismatch every single day. So because of that, 
they have difficulty, again, getting air in and getting air out. So what's the chronic result here in these patients? They build up oxygen, um, they build up CO2, and then they drop their oxygen. So they usually exhibit chronic hypoxemia. That chronic hypoxemia as a result of this hypoventilation and VQ mismatch leads to hypoxic vasoconstriction. These vessels clamp down like a son of a gun. So then you get this intense vasoconstriction. When this vessel vasoconstricts, what it does is it makes the pressure and the resistance, I'm sorry, resistance in the vessel really high. So as a result here, your peripheral vascular resistance goes up. And then the pressure in the arteries go up. So these patients develop something called pulmonary hypertension. And then what happens is, is if your pressures in the actual pulmonary arteries get really, really high, what happens is the right heart has to develop such a very strong stroke volume and cardiac output against the high afterload. And what happens over time is this will cause the right heart to really become strained and begin to fail and develop features of right heart failure. Now, if the right heart fails, they have difficulty getting blood into the heart and difficulty getting blood out of the heart, right? Maybe because of hypertrophy or dilation or just high afterload. Because of that, they can't get blood out of the heart, the pressure inside of the right heart increases and it starts backing up into the vena cava. And this leads to elevated centrovenous pressures. This will back up and go down and develop many different features such as It'll develop jugular venous distension via the superior vena cava. It'll go down the inferior vena cava and cause hepatomegaly. It could even cause ascites. And last but not least, it may go into the lower extremities and cause pedal edema. So these are the potential findings that could develop as a result of core pulmonale, which is usually defined as pulmonary hypertension due to an underlying lung disease. You know what type of pulmonary hypertension this is? This is an example of type three. So here, let's write that down. This is an example of type three. All right. The last thing that I wanna say here, but it actually should be relatively common understanding is that most patients who develop bronchiectasis, the common causes are recurrent infections. When patients who develop bronchiectasis, guess what else happens? They build up mucus and they can't clear the actual mucus from their airways. Mucus is an area where bacteria love to colonize and stay. So because of that, they have lots of bacteria developing within their airways. And in high amounts, that can cause infections. So patients with bronchiectasis are not only can develop it because of chronic infections, but they can develop very frequent pulmonary infections. And that's something else to watch out for as a potential complication of bronchiectasis. Let's talk about how to diagnose it. When a patient comes in, I'd say one of the biggest things is look for that pro productive foul smelling cough frequent pulmonary infections, um, and on top of that, hemoptysis. Those are the big things. Get a chest x-ray. A chest x-ray is gonna be kind of helpful because anytime someone has a nasty cough or hemoptysis and you know potential signs that they could have like COPD or bronchiectasis, it's good to get a chest x-ray to just get a look. So in COPD, you see that kind of classic hyperinflation, increased lucency, AP diameter, all that stuff. Uh, flat diaphragm. In bronchiectasis, you see something very specific. You see kind of like these like bronchial cuffing and tram track signs. But that's not always the best off your chest x-ray. So one of the things I like to do is get the PFTs to say, okay, I still think it could be an obstructive lung disease. I don't know if it's chronic bronchitis or if it is bronchiectasis. Get the PFTs because that can be helpful. If it shows a low FEV1, a low FEC, and an FEV1 over FEC ratio that's less than 70%, that's definitely supportive of obstructive lung disease. Even if they have this increased total lung capacity, residual volume, functional residual capacity, we definitely know it's obstructive lung disease. Particularly maybe in this case, bronchiectasis, if they have chest x-ray findings that are supportive of it. What would be the real good test though to really help me if I'm confused between COPD and this particular case of bronchiectasis? A high resolution CT is really good. The reason why is, Radiographically, bronchiectasis is oftentimes diagnosed. And what you look for is you look for this massive bronchial dilation. Look how dilated and cystic appearing these airways look. On top of that, there's also another one which we use like the ratio between the bronchial wall. Here's your bronchial kind of like wall here. And here's an associated like vessel. Usually when the wall, bronchial wall diameter in comparison to the vascular diameter is like greater than one or 1 1.5, it's super suggestive of bronchiectasis. So if I have chest x-ray findings that may be supportive of bronchiectasis, obstructive lung disease findings, and a high resolution CT that shows these findings, I can pretty much with confidence say I have bronchiectasis. So then you gotta figure out the cause. 
So oftentimes that kind of means going back and looking, okay, do they have any things that would suggest what? Cystic fibrosis, test the you know sweat chloride test or the CFTR test, uh, check for immune, immune deficiencies, check the IG levels, check for HIV. Look to see, do they have any kind of like massive like tumor or foreign body that's present within the airways on their CT scan or their bronx shows that, okay, maybe it's an airway obstruction. Do they have autoimmune factors? Maybe it's RA or SLE. Do they have a sputum culture that suggests that they have H flu or pseudomonas or mycobacterium or aspergillosis? Maybe it's recurrent infections. And so those are the ways that we can kind of go about looking at bronchiectasis. Now, how do we treat these patients? Well, one of the biggest things is finding the cause and treating the underlying cause because that'll reduce the chronic inflammation, whether it's reducing the mucus production, reducing the um, kind of like bacteria accumulation, reducing the chronic inflammation, autoimmune diseases. You got to treat that. But one of the things that you can kind of do while you're treating the underlying cause is really clear that mucus, man, because that stuff can really kind of cause problems as you saw the downward cascade of it. So usually this is via chest physiotherapy. You can do this like this, this little child probably has cystic fibrosis. So they have on this like vest and it kind of like per hits and kind of percusses the chest and helps them to kind of cough and clear their secretions. You can also kind of lay them in certain postural positions where you can help to drain some of the secretions and clap and hit on their back. Sometimes you can do nebulizing therapies that are kind of like thin up the mucus like hypertonic saline or muco um in acetylcysteine therapies and that kind of thins out the mucus making it easier to cough but anything to kind of clear that mucus is really important so that you don't trap bacteria and cause chronic inflammation the other thing is in these patients you're doing mucus clearance but you're also going to have a lot of bacteria that are colonizing so i think it's important to reduce bacterial growth to knock down the risk of recurrent exacerbations and infections and so you have to ask yourself the question has the patient had three plus exacerbations where they've had to be treated with antibiotics per year then they probably need to be on an antibiotic therapy until determined otherwise. And you should probably try to tailor it towards the pathogen from their sputum culture. Because if it's pseudomonas, fluoroquinolones are gonna be preferable outpatient. And if it's not pseudomonas, azithromycin may be the preferred me me measurement there. The last thing I think is really important for bronchiectasis is reducing the risk of homoptysis. These patients may require bronchial artery embolization at some point in time in their life, and if they have recurrent events of homoptysis, it may even require surgical resection of the disease log segments. But my friends, that covers bronchiectasis. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.